Well, I'm very happy to say I'm back with Ron Thompson, former uh, warden, Wanky National Park, uh, trained ecologist. Uh, I could go on a long time, Ron. I, I don't know if there's anybody out there who knows more about African wildlife and elephant than you do. There probably is, but but I don't know who that person is. So I think um, I consider myself very lucky to be able to tap into what you know about these very pressing problems. And the one that's particularly pertinent right now is what's happening in Kruger National Park. Um, I know anybody interested in wildlife and any South African uh, needs to understand that this natural, this national treasure is in very serious trouble and um, not enough people know about it. So just to kick off, Ron, uh, tell us about the genesis of the problem um, in Kruger. Why and how did we get to where we are now? I was first introduced to this issue, if you like, not in Kruger, but in Wanky National Park, where when I was a young ranger there in, in 1960. Um, and since then, we've discovered it actually has occurred right throughout Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. I'm not so familiar with what is happening in, in East Africa, <coughs> except that the, the elephant issues in East Africa were greatly modified by the fact that the political elites of, the, of East African countries, right down, in fact, to Zimbabwe, were all interfered with by um, by people making money out of poaching elephants. And when I say people, I'm talking about political elites, presidents and, and, their, and their families and, and uh, uh, people in government. It was after, immediately after the, um, the d destruction of colonialism. And these people felt now is the time, the East African word for it or, or message was, now is the time for us to feed. And um, that is a horrific story, which has to be told on its own. But elephants, elephants breed prolifically. People don't understand this. Elephants are very capable, and they've done so on a regular basis, very capable of doubling their numbers every 10 years. And people don't understand. 10 years' time is a very short space of time for 1,000 elephants to become 2,000, to become 4,000, to become 8,000. And when you go back in the history of, of national park management in Africa, you're going back to about, you started around about 1960. And in, in Wanky National Park in 1960, we counted elephants that year at the height of the dry season on the night of the full moon and went through a 24 hour period. We counted every animal above the size of a jackal that came down to drink at the water holes in Wanky. And in those days, there were only 14 water holes. And we counted 3,500 elephants. We had the whole of the National Parks Board there conducting, helping us conduct the operation. It became part of, of one of the cultures of the, uh, of the National Parks and Wildlife Management people in Rhodesia, in what became Zimbabwe. So they were all there. And we had taken them around and shown them the damage the elephants were doing to the trees, particularly the mukwa trees, or in South Africa, what they call the kiat, the Pterocarpus angolensis. And there were more trees lying on their backs than there were standing up. But it wasn't only them, it was all the acacia species, all the big palm trees. They're all being knocked down by the elephants. So they, they, they decided after the count that they had to discuss what, um, what this all meant and what we were going to do about it. With the, whole, with the whole board being there, whole National Parks board being down for this social event, this elephant count, we counted 3,500. And Sir Hugh Beadle, who was then the, the um, chairman of the National Parks Board, said, we've got to discuss this because obviously, if the elephants are continuing to, to destroy the habitat, we've got too many elephants. And this is when I first came across the, the notion that the carrying capacity for elephants in a national park is the maximum number of elephants that the national park can carry without causing permanent damage to the habitat. I will say that again, without causing permanent damage to the habitat. And Sir Hugh Beadle pointed out to everybody at the board there that this is an indication that 3,500 elephants in Wanky National Park was too many because they were still destroying all the habitat. So he says, we've now counted the elephants. We are the board. We are here at main camp. Why don't we have an impromptu board meeting to discuss it all? And I was invited to that meeting. 
That was in October 1960. And it was decided then that 3,000, it was accepted then that 3,500 elephants were too many elephants for Wanki National Park, that we should perhaps think about reducing it to 2,500 elephants and see whether or not the damage, the damage would be ameliorated, whether the damage would stop, whether the amount of, of interference that the elephants were ha having with the habitat would in fact be sustainable. It was just a thumbs up. Nobody knew. Nobody ever heard of we didn't discuss the, the issue of carrying capacity. So we set about after that, after that, that meeting, um, I got involved in, in heavy elephant hunting in, um, in the area surrounding Wanki National Park. And we were told that if we went out, we, if every, every crop season, we were out shooting elephants because they were, they were raiding the local people's crops. And the local people depended upon their crops for survival. They were mostly in the belly people around Wanky. So we would go out and we would shoot the individual crop raiders. But our instructions after that meeting were, if you go out shooting crop raiders and you come across any other elephants, you must just knock them out, take them out. It's a good way of utilizing the carcasses because they would be, the elef elephants would be killed in the tribal areas where the local people could get the meat and they didn't have to venture into the park to do anything about it. We were providing with meat on the hoof. Immediately, we, we, we shot those elephants. So we, we set about trying to reduce the elephants by a thousand, starting in 1960, well, late 1960. And th that carried on for a long time. Um, whether we reached that number, I don't know. We shot a lot of elephants during that period. We were the first people, I think, in Africa to start taking out whole herds of elephants. We would go in whole family herds, the cows, the calves, right down to the newborn babies. When we got into those herds, if it was outside the park, we wiped it out. And the local people came and they took, they took the, all the meat for themselves, which was a good outcome of those killings. However, by 1965, the elephant population in Wanky, despite the large numbers that Tim Braybrook and I, we were really the two people doing it all, despite the numbers of elephants that we had shot, the population had risen in 1965 to 5,000 elephants. It was, then, it was then determined that we had to have culling inside the park. Up until then, the board said, the national park is a sanctuary. We must remain a sanctuary. So if you're going to reduce the elephants, when they naturally went out during the rains, shoot them when they're outside the park, but don't shoot them inside the park. Keep the park a sanctuary for elephants. Um, but after 1965, it got so bad the destruction was so bad that they started culling operations. Five onwards, they started taking elephants out inside the National Park. So this was my introduction to this issue of, of too many elephants in a National Park. And I was a bit bewildered at the beginning because I thought a National Park, I had given no thought to carrying capacities or what the elephants did or anything. Just a National Park was a sanctuary for, for animals, especially elephants. And, and my, my little juvenile brain at the time couldn't countenance the fact that we would be shooting elephants in Wanky National Park. But after a while, you get into it and, and you get used to it. Since then, I've discovered all over the place, we have had problems with elephants. In Matusa Donna National Park and Lake Kariba, for example, they wiped out all the, all the Brachystesia trees along the mountains, Matusa Donna, um, Matusa Donna Mountains. In the Chisarira, they wiped out all, all the big um, Mayomba woodland on the plateau of the Chisarira Game Reserve. Wanky was an absolute disaster. I went to Chobe in 1960 and I saw the forest at Chobe on the Chobe River there for the first and only time for a long, long period of time. Um, and it was in those days pristine. It appeared to be pristine and it was marvelous to see a beautiful riverine forest along the river. I've just filmed it. There is practically nothing left. There are just a dozen giant big trees there, but the forest itself is gone. I could give you all the facts and details, but it's happening in Botswana right as we see it. Of a, of a, where I have been given access to a film of, um, of a thousand elephants in one herd in Botswana. When I went there 10, <coughs> let me see, 20 years ago now, I was actually went in there to film the impact that elephants had on their habitat. And in the horseshoe area of the, of the Kwando River uh, in the Caprivi Strip, I saw 2,000 elephants in one herd at one time. Now, 
these animals are eating two to 300 kilograms of food every day on average. What do you think after 20 years is left of the habitat in those areas when you had those numbers of elephants? In South Africa in 1983, I found the same thing happening in Kruger National Park. In those days, they were, they were still culling the elephants. And the, the, the story in Kruger I followed in great detail. And I've just recently filmed from the southern part to the northern part of Kruger right through the impact of elephants on their habitats. And this has been something of a special interest for me. Um, it, I, I'm not against Kruger National Park. These are part and parcel of my brotherhood. But I don't think that they appreciate what I'm trying to say to them. Because I had, I, I had to say to everybody, what is the carrying capacity for your game as whether it be in Chobe or whether it be in Wanky or whether it be in, in Kruger. You know, none of the scientists could tell me what, what their carrying capacity was, none. And then in, um, I, I got speaking, uh, I became director of the Buddhist Wana National Parks Board for three years. And during those three years, on the, on the board was Dr. Rocco Knobel, who was the director of Sand Parks, what is now Sand Parks in South Africa, the South African National Parks Board. And he and I got onto long discussions because at the time there were still culling elephants in, in Kruger. And I wanted to know the details because I had got this long history, I have had this long history of, of, of my relationship with elephants and their habitats. And he said to me that in, 19, in 1944, well, first of all, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, there were no elephants in Kruger, none. The first 10 arrived in 1905 from adjacent Mozambique where they were being hunted. And after that, although there were no specific records of individual um, immigrations of, of elephants, they must have in, um, come in from Botswana also to increase the numbers. Because we, you couldn't get to what we have got today from 10 elephants. So they must have come in from somewhere. But from Practically the whole of the 19th century, practically the whole of it, there were no elephants in Kruger. So the, when in the 1940s it was discovered that the elephant population was starting to, uh, a botanist there called um, Albert Fulun set up a set of, of study areas in the Satara area of, of Kruger. And these, this was an extensive area. He chose he chose the Satara area because the woodland, the deciduous woodland there, and the Kruger was almost end to end was, was good quality deciduous woodland in those days. He said the Satara uh, woodland was convenient because there was a road going through it, and it was representative of the deciduous woodlands throughout the whole park. So instead of counting all the trees in all the park, they put set aside this very large area where they, they measured it all off and they counted the numbers of trees. Every, any tree that had a canopy of 15 meters or more was considered to be a top canopy tree because all the habitats fitted underneath that, that shade component under those top canopy trees. So you had, if you can imagine a woodland with all these very big trees and underneath it, an understory, thick understory that was dependent upon the shade from those big trees. Understory habitats cannot live in open sunlight. That's why they are understory plants. So when you remove a big tree, all the understory habitats underneath it dies out because it can't, it can't grow in total sunlight. So anyway, this thing was set up and it was determined that, um, that there were on average 13 trees per hectare in, in the Satara study, extensive study area. 13 big top canopy trees per hectare. And that carried on for the next 16 years. It, it, it didn't change. There were always, every year when they counted them, there was always an average of 13 top canopy trees within these woodlands. Um, and then in, in, 19, in 1959, the, the scientist in Kruger, for the first time, they, they, they discovered that the Alomolotia, that, that a species of plant had been wiped out by the elephants. By then the elephants were building up in number, 
but the trees have, were unaffected. It would appear that the trees are unaffected. But it seems that there was a bit of negligence in terms of the counting there from time to time. So one must be hesitant about accepting that there, that there had been no, none. But the, the, there is no record of any of the Satara trees ever being damaged um, prior to, to, to 19, well, prior to 1965. But it would appear prior to the e extinction of the Aromolotii in, this, in, the, in the lower part of Kruger. So I'm going to assume that the elephants, in, or I did assume that the elephants in Kruger um, were within the carrying capacity, whatever their number was, was within the carrying capacity of the Kruger habitats because in, 19, in the 1950s, 1950 to 1960, it would appear that the, that the, the Satara top canopy trees were still intact. They had not been damaged. And the criteria or the definition for carrying capacity is the maximum number of elephants that, that a habitat can carry without causing damage to the habitat. It's very important that. So in the 1950s, because there was no damage to the Satara trees, I must assume that the elephant numbers in the 1950s were within the carrying capacity of the habitat. I think everyone will understand the, the logic of that. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened then was that in 19, in 1965, they did it. They, that year, they did a count of the of the Satara trees, and they were all horrified. All the whole scientific community in Kruger was horrified to discover that the numbers of trees in Kruger, on average, had been reduced from 13 to nine trees per hectare. That was in 1965. They then asked for a special meeting with the director of the National Parks Board because they wanted to discuss this, they suddenly felt that there was a need for culling elephants to reduce them to stop the destruction of the trees, which is a reasonable attitude to take. Now, Rocco Knobel, Dr. Rocco Knobel was then the director of the South African National Parks Board, and he went to this special meeting. Well, it was an ordinary meeting, but in, in, in uh, Skakuza, in Kruger, the headquarters of Kruger, um, but it was specially to discuss the elephant issue. And uh, he said to his scientists, what is your carrying capacity for elephants in Kruger? Nobody could tell him. He said, well, how do you expect me to discuss with you how many elephants you're going to cull if you don't know what the carrying capacity is? How many elephants have you got now? It's 1965. So the answer came out, we've got 7,000, plus or minus 7,000. So that was the baseline that he thought, that, that he was given. So... Um, what happened then, he agreed. He said, if the trees are being knocked down, as, as you say they are, something's got to be done. But without that carrying capacity number, I don't know how I can tell you what we're going to reduce it. I can't discuss it with you. Because the numbers of elephants you should be carrying must be no more than the carrying capacity. And if you can't tell me what it is, how can I tell you how many elephants you must reduce your herds to? And that is reasonable. That's a good, a good attitude, a good argument. He said, so what I'm going to do in the absence of a carrying capacity figure, I'm going to tell you, let's not let the elephant population get any bigger than it already is. You say it is 7,000 now. Okay, so let's do a culling operation and keep the population down to 7,000. Don't every year, if it goes up, reduce it to 7,000. You've got to count the elephants every year then. So that was the basis of, of, the, of the, the start of the culling in Kruger National Park. It took them. It took the, the, the Parks Board two years to set up an abattoir at Skakusa, which they felt was big enough to handle all the meat and the carcasses that were coming out of a culling operation. Um, and that delayed the cull by two years. The cull actually started in 1967. And in 1967, at the start of the cull, they said, let's count the trees again. So they counted the trees again, and they found that the trees had been reduced still further to six trees per hectare. So between 1965 to 1967, in those two years, the population of trees had dropped from nine to six. They started culling in 1967, and that culling went on for 27 years, right up to 1994. And every year, religiously, they cut that population down to 7,000. At the end of the year, the population was back to plus or minus 7,000. When you look at what happened to the trees, they started looking a little bit more specifically at the trees then. Um, 
this is what they discovered, that in 1974, the trees had been reduced to three trees per hectare. By 1981, the trees had been re reduced, at Satara had been reduced to 1.5 trees per hectare. By 1994, there were no, no more trees left standing at Satara, none. They'd been, all been wiped out. What amazes me is that, I mean, uh, the people involved in this were all very, very people, but nobody thought to look at what was happening to the trees and say 7,000 is too many elephants for Kruger. Because if, if the population of trees were continuing to, to, to be reduced, then clearly 7,000 was far too many elephants. But nobody thought of that. Nobody thought of, let's change the, the culling target every year from 7,000 to 6,000 or 5,000 or whatever. Nobody thought of that. They carried on religiously taking the population down to 7,000. And at the end of 1994, when people said, how many trees have you got left in Kruger? They said, none. So they said, well, what happened in the park as a whole? And the scientists for the first time in Kruger told the South African public that the trees in Kruger National Park as a whole, in their estimation, had been reduced by 95% throughout that culling era. Culling stopped in 1994. So from 19, oh, well, the other thing I have to tell you about this is that throughout that culling period of 27 years, autopsies were done on, on the hundreds of elephants that were killed every year. All, full autopsies were done on every carcass. As a result of which, the scientists were able to very clearly classify the, or, or make a statement to the effect that the elephants of Kruger throughout the culling era um, had been increasing the annual incremental rate for 7.5% per year. The numbers in which the population increased every year was 7.5% of the total population. Now, 7.2% gives you an exact doubling time for a population. If your population is doubling at 7.2%, it is if it's increasing at 7.2%, it's doubling every 10 years. 5% is above 7.2%. So the population throughout that period was increasing at a rate slightly better than every 10 years, but every nine point something years, the elephant population was doubling. But let's say it was doubling every 10 years for convenience sake, because we're having to look at rough figures here anyway. So then what, what, what happened there on a little bit further on, about another 10 years time, when the scientists was, were asked, how many trees have the tr elephants taken off in Kruger now? And they said more than 95%. They didn't know how many it was. All they knew that it was a hell of a lot of trees had gone down. Can you imagine what has happened to a woodland when 95% of it and more of its top canopy trees have disappeared? What happens to all the understory? It disappears as well. So, so you mustn't look at the damage the elephants did to the habitats in Kruger purely in terms of the top trees. You've got to look at the whole structure. The whole structure disappeared. The other thing to, to try and give you some perspective of this, some visual appreciation of, of what we're talking about here, for every single tree that is still standing in Kruger National Park today, in 1960, there were 20 other trees standing alongside it. Now that gives you an idea of exactly how this population or this this habitat has just deteriorated like that. Ron, can I just ask you? So, what is the what is the what is the estimated population of, of Kruger today? <laughs> well, we're jumping a little bit ahead, but I'll tell you. Um, right throughout the, the the last ten years, the Kruger staff. Well, since 1994, there have been no elephant counts done in Kruger at all. None. Um, you'll have to ask the Kruger staff why, but none have been done. So, but they carried on telling you how many elephants were there. The, the Kruger staff, some said that the population had stabilized, the elephant population at 15,000. Some say it has stabilized at 17,000. That's poppycock. There is no ways that a population which in 1994 which had an incremental rate of 7.5%, could possibly have reduced itself like that now. Mm -hmm. or, or by that time, by the, by the by, um, 20, 2015, say. 
There's no possibility that that could have mm. happened. Mm. And what happens with, with elephant populations is this, is that once, once the nutrition levels in the habitat are reduced below a certain threshold, your elephant, the, the starvation sets in. Now, you, the, the most obvious one is that um, elephant cows with baby calves at foot stop producing milk because they have to they have to eat enough food to keep themselves alive and they've got to eat more food to produce milk to feed their babies. Now, this, I don't believe, my own interpretation of what is happening in Kruger, I don't believe that stage has been reached in Kruger yet. Why don't I believe that? Because the first sign of elephants at that level of distress starts, the first manifestation of that is that baby elephants are abandoned by their mothers and they wander out on their own and they're killed by lions and hyenas and they're eaten by lions and hyenas. I have, uh, on, the, on the two, three weeks that we did in Gruga recently and speaking to the staff and what have you, this is not a common feature in Kruger yet. It may happen, but it's not a common feature. That means that Kruger hasn't reached that final threshold where you're going to start getting lots of babies. But Botswana has. Botswana at one stage, 10 year, even up to 10 years ago, was, was every week uh, out of Kasani into Toby, for example, there were elephant, baby elephant carcasses being found, being eaten by lions and hyenas all over the place every week. And the reason for that was the elephants had to go to water. And the, the water was all in the Chobe River. So these elephants ate all the edible food near the river. That's why the river on forest of Chobe has virtually disappeared. Um, and they then, they then eat the edible food closest to the water first. They eat everything out, the roots, everything, the whole bang shoot. And every year, the elephants are getting more and more every year, doubling the numbers every 10 years at the height of the dry season to get, to get enough food to stay alive. And eventually, the amount of energy they need to get from the water, which they have to visit every day to drink, particularly the cows, the cowherds have to drink every day. They had to move up to 25 kilometers or 10 miles away from the water mm, in order to get enough food to stay alive. Now, the amount of energy that they used to get from the water to where the food was, because everything in between had been eaten out, the amount of energy they got from the food they ate was less than the energy they needed to get from the water to the food and back to the water again. Mm -hmm. and because of that, that's where the mother elephants start, um, start, uh, stop lactating. That's when the elephants are abandoned. And that, has quite, that stage, in my opinion, hasn't yet been reached in Kruger. But what do you, what do you um, estimate? Uh, I know it's, it's an estimate, but what, what would you guess is, is the is a ballpark figure for the current population of Kruger? If you, if you double your numbers every 10 years going on from 1994, when we know there were 7,000, that was the last year of the cull, 7,000, they were reduced to 7,000 in 1994, and you multiply that, you double that number every 10 years, you're getting up into the region of about 56,000 elephants. Now, has it got that, that high? I don't know. And and I have made this recent trip, a week's trip I have just done through, I made no attempt to even try and assess the numbers of elephant because my problem or my issue or my task in visiting Kruger this time was to get some indication of the impact that the elephants were having on their habitats mm -hmm. so that I could come back from that with something on film, proof on film, to tell people like we are telling them right now, to tell them what the elephants are doing in, in Kruger. Listening to this tale of it's, it's a very gloomy scenario we face. In fact, it's a it's it's a natural catastrophe unfolding. In your travels and your discussions, you you must interact with the animal rights activists um, who are very vocal and have the support of politicians and NGOs around the world. What what if any solutions do they? do they come up with to this problem? Do they, first, do they acknowledge the problem? And if so, do they, what, what are their answers? Let me ask you a question. If you have got broken furniture, who do you ask to come and fix your furniture? Do you ask a plumber or do you ask a builder or do you ask a carpenter? 
your animal writers haven't a clue about what goes on in the wild. And I can tell you that a lot of the people who in Botswana today, for example, have got big expensive lodges where they're inviting international film stars and people like this to come at about, a, uh, I don't know, 5,000 5, rand or $5,000 a night to go and stay in these very expensive lodges. Why do they get these, exp these affluent people to come there? Because they say, we are able to show you the big spectacles of elephants. I have just been presented. Somebody has just sent me now, and I would invite all my, all my readers who have got films, video films on this, because I'm, doing a, I'm finalizing the film on Kruger now, but I will be doing the same thing in the Botswana thing. We've already done our, our filming in Botswana, but we, we need to get photographs or films of lions and hyenas or both eating baby elephants. We need to get some of these big herds of elephants. I've just, as I say, I have just seen uh, a video which is coming to me now, which will be included in the film of a thousand elephants in one herd. Now, I have seen 2,000 elephants in the same area 10 years ago. So these massive numbers of elephants are there. Now, the reason why these people who own these big lodges and Ian Karma, the previous prime minister of Botswana, is one of them. He has also got lodges there. His finances are now tied up in the tourism industry. They, he is now claiming they don't want to kill elephants in, 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 in Botswana. All the, all the people who own these big lodges in, 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 um, in Botswana, they are all, not all, but I would say most of them are animal writers. Some of them are, are rabid animal writers. They believe their businesses will collapse if they are not able to create these big spectacles or show their clients these big spectacles of a thousand elephants at a time. It's quite frightening to see numbers of that size and then to know the ecological consequences of those numbers. But these people say, no, the elephants in Botswana have stabilized because they've eaten so much of the food now, they can't make, get any more because the nutrition levels are so low because it's been eaten out that the elephant population is stabilized. There, therefore, we have got, we don't have to worry about culling elephants. We don't have to shoot any, any elephants because nature will sort it out themselves with the nutrition factor. But what they don't know, and, they, and all the animal writers have got this attitude, and all these people who've got these big lodges have got this attitude. And these are the people who are putting pressure on the politicians not to do the right thing. Fortunately, President Masisi there has got his head screwed on the right way. I think he will do the right thing. So far, he's doing the right thing. When you say, when, when you, when you, say just, just quickly, just rebut that argument. What they're saying is, okay, we're overpopulated, but it's it's leveled out, and nature will now take its course. What is your yes. what is your what is your response to that argument? They're missing something. One of the most vital things of all. The people who have that argument, your animal righteous argument, the people who want these big spectacles, who feel they can't exist unless they've got the big spectacles. One thing they are not taking into account is that the whole purpose of a national park is to maintain species diversity. You don't go to a national park to see a thousand elephants. You want to see fish eagles, marshall eagles, ground hornbills, puku, all these other animals which are disappearing because their habitat has been destroyed by the elephants. Mm -hmm. So you're going to end up, all these areas will end up being an elephant farm with nothing else on them except elephants, and everything else will disappear. I've got figures from, from what the, 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 elephant, the um, animal species were in Botswana in 1965 and what they were in 1964, in, in 2004, which is 39 years later. And the animals that were there in, in 1965 are no longer there now. They've, they've died out because the habitat has disappeared, it's changed. So the, the, the whole spectrum, I think you've got to understand that um, when Dr. Graham Child went there in 1965, he counted the trees in the, in the Chobe River Iron Forest and, did, and he recorded 299 what he called super giant trees in that forest along the river frontage. When he went back again in 2004 with his son now, Professor Brian Child, they, all, they then redid this whole thing. There was practically nothing left. When I say practically nothing, there were two of this and three of that and six of the other. All the others had been killed off by too many elephants. So the animal so, rights, the animal, if I just want to get this right, because I, I, uh, it's something of great interest to me. So the animal rights argument is leave them, um, 
and let let nature take its course. There's no uh, no human intervention required. That's what they say. That's what a lot of people say. They have convinced the general public that way of thinking. But I can tell you now, the Kruger National Park at the moment it's it's it, it had fantastic biological di diversities in the 1940s and 50s. Now that that biological diversity is disappearing, and one of one of the most shocking things is ha is happening there is that the the Marshall Eagle, the beautiful big Marshall Eagle, which requires vast areas of a wild, open, wild country in order to live, it is disappearing. It's disappearing. Why? Mainly because all the big trees that it used to breed in are all being knocked down. There are no big trees for these Marshall Eagles to breed in anymore. The ground hornbills need these big old trees with holes in them to breed inside the holes. These animals, these birds are just hanging on by the skin of their teeth at the moment. They will go out. They will go out. When I tell you some of the things that we saw, um, I was horrified. And I'm hoping that everybody else will be horrified. Because one of the big problems in Kruger has been every time a Kruger scientist has come up and said, we, we, think, we think we must think about culling elephants again. There's a big hue and cry. And, and uh, the animal rights is climbing go to the politicians and they change the politicians' mind and there's a moratorium put on any culling. So the scientists can't even get their own wishes carried out in Kruger National Park because the animal rights are convincing the politicians what should and should not be done. Ron, is the elephant overpopulation in the area impacting on the local community, the local indigenous community, the um, people that live in the, in, in, in the vicinity of the park? The park neighbors. Yeah. The park neighbors. Not really. Um, there's a lot spoken about the conflict, the, the big game um, human conflict. Um, I'm, I, I, I've been in this business now for, for right in the business with my nose right deep in it for 62 years. And I've come across, I have shot a lot of elephants and lions and all sorts of things that have killed people and eaten them and what have you. But you know, the incidence of that is very, very small. Mm. When when a lion kills and eats somebody, it's big news all over the world because it's a fantastic tragedy. But in actual fact, in terms of the numbers of people mm. and the increase in the numbers of people and that sort of thing, and the, the pressure that they're bringing on the game reserve, it's negligible, yeah. absolutely yeah. negligible. Mm. Surely elephants, elephants go in and raid people's crops. If they do, shoot the damn things and let the people eat them. That is what we did in the early days in the 1960s. And there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and then you're culling was in, conducted in the park, was reducing them further, were trying to reduce them in the park all the time. But the problem is, is that, let, let me tell you what, what, what makes my mind um, bubble over, is that if the carrying capacity in Wanky was 2,500, we were asked to reduce them in 1960 from 3,500 to 2,500, if 2,500 two was the figure, and I think 2,500 is closer to the figure than 3,500 was, then we must look at what we, what's happening today. 2,500 elephants in Wanky National Park, at, which is 5,000 square miles in extent, comes to a population density of one elephant per two square miles, one elephant per five square kilometers, and 2,500 is that number. Today, Wanky National Park, despite the culling that has gone on, today Wanky National Park has on average 50,000 elephants. Should be at two and a half. You tell me what that is doing to the habitat. This is what is in my mind, what confronts my, my memories and, um, and the history of, of Wanky. And the same thing is happening in, in Kruger. I, don't, I, I, I personally believe that the Kruger population is bigger than, than 30,000 or 34,000. I'm, I'm convinced it's bigger than that. But let's accept that. I'll accept it's, 30, it's, it's that. 30,000 elephants or 34,000 elephants in Kruger National Park today is nine times the carrying capacity of, of, of the habitat. Carrying capacity of Kruger is, is 3,500 plus or minus 500. Three and a half thousand. They are now thirty-four thousand. It's just on nine times too many elephants. Can well, you understand why the habitats are being trashed like this? 
Ron, one one possible solution, which which as you know has been bandied around for a while, and 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 some people have tried very hard to make it a reality, was the Trans Frontier National Park System, which was designed, which was aiming at at increasing the range of of the elephant and other big game, and giving them a bigger area in which to forage. Um, on paper, that is a potential solution. Uh, if, if, the, if the elephant that are concentrated in Kruger moved into other areas, possibly in Mozambique, and the same with the elephant in Chobe and Wanki moved back into Western Zambia and probably into Angola. Um, on, you know, that does look like, in theory, that looks like a, a solution, but it doesn't, for one reason or another, doesn't seem to have got enough traction to make any impression on these on these big numbers in concentrated areas, and why is that? What you've got to understand is the elephants in. Let, let's look at Chobi because Chobi is a, a better. I can express it better for Chobi than you can for Kruger. Chobi, the Chobi elephants, or Botswana shares its elephant population with five other other countries. That is, in northern. Northeastern Namibia, southeastern Angola, southern Zambia, um, western Zimbabwe, that is Wanki, and the whole of, whole of the Chobe complex from 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 the Okavanga swamps right down to right down to, to the Limpopo. Mm -hmm. um, and I've heard figures. I'm not an expert on the numbers, but I have heard figures produced by experts in this field, people who are doing this as a living, that the total elephant population of that entire complex is over 200,000, 215,000, something like that. Now, you've got to understand what a population is. You cannot manage a species. You cannot say, I'm going to manage elephants all over Africa now, we're gonna manage elephants, which is what the great elephant census tried, tried to tell people they had to do. It counted all these elephants over a three year period, 315,000 elephants or something that they counted. And they said, that's all we've got to deal with. Now we've got to manage them. How do you manage all these elephant populations? And there are 100, they say there are 150 elephant populations throughout Africa as one species, when they're all one, some live in mountains, some live in deserts, some live in somewhere else and some live in you can only animals of the same species that that live in live, live together in the same habitat and that mate only only with other animals in the same group so you find elephants in ethiopia are different to elephants in kruger mm -hmm. because they're miles mix on a daily basis they eat different things they don't breed together or anything they are separate but the wank, this big complex that I've just mentioned now of all these five countries have got one population. They all intermingle. There's 200 or thousand elephants intermingling. And that what that makes it very difficult. When you go into the habitats and you all the big forest understory in the Chobe National Park is eaten flat. There's nothing left to eat. All the big trees, all the big leadwood trees have gone. All the big acacia trees are gone. All the big trees along the river have gone. They don't eat teak. Elephants don't eat teak, so the teak forest remains. Elephants don't eat Natal mahoganies. But um, so when you go along the rivers, you will see those big trees there. But you can't say, well, look, the elephant hasn't eaten this tree. There is a chance. There isn't a chance because those trees are unpalatable to elephants. But what happens there, here now, is you get a flip agency. Coming in, and that is that the porcupines, which eat all the same trees that the elephants eat, have now got nothing to eat because the elephants have eaten it all. They've killed all the trees that the porcupines normally eat. So now they are focusing on particularly the Natal mahoganies and they're eating all the bark all the way around the bottom of the big Natal mahogany trees. So although the elephants are not killing them, the porcupines are. So you get this, this lead on effect. Yeah. Not going to fit. And, and, and the, uh, uh, another thing is fire. Fire, when you get seedlings coming out, fire wipes out those seedlings. When you get, if you go into Kruger, for example, these big uh, acacia tortillas trees, the big Harkin steers, the big umbrella thorn trees, which are magnificent big trees, which are very valuable to a lot of game animals. Those, those trees, um, 
the, when the impala eat the seeds, the impala goes out and it goes through their system, it comes out in their dung. So wherever impala go, when they're eating the seeds, they're dropping these seeds of these big trees. But what is happening in Kruger today, because of the intensity or the, 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 the great density of the elephant population, is that all the big trees are being ring barked. All the bark has been eat, eaten off. The big trees are dying. And sooner, very soon, there will be no big trees left to provide seed to, 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 to distribute, to keep the population of those trees or the species growing in Kruger National Park. It won't happen because they need seeds. And the seeds only come from the big trees. The big trees are all being knocked off. Now, the other thing that happens, you can go to places. If you go out of Chingwedzi and, and various places, like this, you will see young, a few, not very many, you will see young um, acacia tortoise trees growing up. But when you look there, every single one of them is surrounded by a herd of impala, and they're all eating them down to the ground. So the impala, like the porcupine, like fire, and could do and all these other things, they contribute to the problem of, of, of leveling everything off and destroying everything. In, in, in Botswana, this has reached a much, a much more advanced stage than it has in Kruger. But Kruger is going that way. And what, what I want to do with the film I'm making, what I want to do with what we're doing right now, is I want people to understand that there is a problem. It is a huge problem. If if Kruger is going to do something about this problem, it's got to, it has got to reduce the number of elephants that it's got down to a level just below the carrying capacity to allow to allow the whole thing to regenerate. And it may even have to start looking at, oh, there are all sorts of problems. It becomes terribly involved. But what is Kruger going to do? It's now got 30,000 elephants. What is Kruger going to do with those elephants? If, if there, there, are, there are three ways that, that you can re reduce elephant populations. One, you could do it by hunting, but you can shoot as many bulls as you like. And most hunters hunt bulls. They shoot as many bulls as you like. The 400 elephant bulls that have been shot in Botswana today is not going to make any effect, not the slightest effect on the elephants there. You've got to shoot the cows. You've got to shoot the breeding elements. You've got to stop the breeding potential. So you, 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 first of all, you can carry on shooting the bulls. It's a good thing that you shoot the bulls. The local people get the money for it. They start getting an, uh, an, an emotional ownership over their elephants, which is good. They don't understand how it all works, but at least they say they will stop the poachers from killing the elephants because the people are, are getting benefits from it if this happens. So I'm, I'm, I approve the hunting, but I don't approve the fact that Botswana is not, not doing any Kali or Kruger or Wanky. So... We, we, they're not getting to the root cause. Unfortunately, but how can you say to the public, how uh, how can you say to the South African public, we want to remove thirty thousand elephants from Kruger? What's what's the public yeah. going to say? The animal rights are going to have a ball. Well, I think you, I think that the politicians are have been effectively captured by the by the green movement, the animal rights people. The, there's no political will because, as far as the rest of the world's concerned, it's just it's um, completely unacceptable. To shoot, to shoot anything, and uh, that's why one can only hope your message gets out there. But my word, you've got um, you're pushing water uphill with uh, world public opinion. Um, and Ron, just you know, talking about hunting, I just you know, it's become a swear word in in across the world now. And um, Boris, Mrs. Boris, uh, Mrs. Uh, J Boris Johnson's wife is leading this crusade in the UK against um, trophy hunting and hunters are considered monsters to be to be excluded from society almost it's it's almost like it's a mental aberration that anybody would want to go out and hunt an animal and that's why I just I want I know it's something that you've looked into this the psychology of um, <coughs> of of hunting and why man, instinctively almost is a hunter and if you take hunting away from from them it does have a, a social impact and i'm not sure how many people are are aware of that fact and um and i just know it's something that you that you know something about can i get can i get back to our plumber carpenter builder um idea mm -hmm. these people who have those ideas and are pushing them they are their personal personal preferences. It's not fact. 
And wildlife can only be managed according to fact, and fact is the truth. The animal writers do not tell the truth. The animal writers propaganda is based upon telling lies. Um, they say, for example, the elephant, and they said this until recently, at CITES, they say it all the time. It's all in all the, in the newspapers. The, the media have got a lot to blame for this. They say the elephant is, is an endangered species. For God's sake, how many, how, many, I mean, how many people would believe that the elephant is an endangered species when they see one herd of a, of a thousand elephants in one go? That's ridiculous. Mm. The, the, the people who, who make these things are ignorant of the, totally ignorant of the facts of wildlife management. Yeah. And you must get plumbers to do plumbing jobs and let wildlife managers to do wildlife management jobs. These people should not be allowed anywhere. Mm. Society should not allow them. Society must wake up and start realizing these people don't know what they're talking about. You cannot, you cannot let these people manage it. The American RICO Act has got a, a, a good interpretation of this. The American RICO Act is it's the Racketeering Influenced um, Criminal Organizations Act. And its purpose was to eradicate um, all the big mafia people in America. They say that if you tell a lie and then make money out of that lie, out of telling that lie, for example, the elephant is an endangered species. The elephant is facing extinction. And then you go around everybody and say, please put money into the, into the kitty. We want to stop the elephant from becoming extinct. That is a lie. That is they're making money out of that lie. That is called common fraud. Mm -hmm. And now I want people to understand this absolutely, completely. The animal writers tell lies like this all the time. Cecil the lion was a big lie, a huge big lie. There were reasons. Cecil was on his own when he was shot. He wasn't taken out of a pride and wank. But forget about him. An elephant is an endangered species. It's facing extinction. Both things not true. Please give us money. They make that story, that propaganda into fraud. The Americans have said now, according to their act, that if you tell a lie, the same lie, the, practice the same fraud more than twice, if you do it two times inside a period of 10 years, then that fraud becomes reclassified as being a racket. And racketeering is recognized as being organized crime. Therefore, I'm going to be so bold as to say all animal rightists are criminals of the organized crime syndrome. And that is what we all have to think about. These are not the saving grace of wildlife. So that's number one. If you look at the psychology of hunting, look, I've done a lot of hunting. I'm not hunting now. I'm too old to go out shooting elephants and lions and things. But I've done a hell of a lot of hunting. Um, and I support hunting. And I support trophy hunting. All the stories here about trophy hunting are absolutely rubbish. But I've, I wrote an article. I wrote an article a little while ago, which I'd like to read to you now. No, please do. It says that the title of it is Crawl Back Into Your Box, You Anti-Hunters. Medical Science Gives Hunters the Thumbs Up Approval. And I say this, for how many years have the animal rights been telling the world that hunting is a cruel, bar barbaric, and archaic practice that should be outlawed by modern society, civilized society? They claim that ordinary hunters are sadistic and or psychopathic and that trophy hunters are mentally ill and derive pleasure from behaviors that hurt other living things. And they are even willing to expend extra effort to make other living beings suffer. Now, a number of internationally renowned social scientists provide us with an opposing opinion. They claim that hunting is a healthy pastime for mankind. And they point out that very few of the articles that claim hunters are crazy are written by behavioral scientists who study humans. Most prominent psychologists of the 20th century, these professional authors state, agree that hunting is motivated by a natural instinct and it is beneficial to mental health. In his highly acclaimed study of human aggression, the anatomy of human destructiveness, psychologist Erich Fromm wrote, in the act of hunting, the hunter returns to his natural state one with the animal he is hunting and is freed from the burden of his ex existential split that is to be part of nature and to transcend transcend nature by virtue, virtue of his consciousness in stalking his quarry the hunter and the animal become equals 
from states, even though man eventually shows his superiority by using his weapons. Consistent with From, Yale sociologist Dr. Stephen Kellett found that the reasons why people hunt are to experience nature as a participant, to feel an intimate sensual connection to place, and to take responsibility for one's food, and to acknowledge kinship with wildlife. Psychiatrist Carl Menninger, MD, wrote, Freud free fearlessly explored the unconscious layers of the personality and disclosed that it is more abnormal for a human, it is no more normal, abnormal for a human to want to kill her in hunting than it is for a cat to want to kill a mouse or a fox or rabbit. Emory University professors Boyd Eaton, MD, anthropologist Marjorie Shostak, conclude that denial of the hunting instinct can lead to psychopathology. They state our hunting instinct has gone awry in civilized society, with the thrill of the chase and the kill are no longer part of our experience, and there are no clear avenues of expression, except perhaps to our peril, in the streets and subways of today's urban jungles. Finally, what are these eminent scientists saying? To me, their message is clear, that the violent crimes that humans inflict upon their fellow man in the big inner cities of, the, of today's ever more congested world are the result of stressed out city people not being able to get released from psychological pressures or social tensions by executing their subconscious natural instinct to hunt. In support of this interpretation, criminologist Chris X, Xridge compared hunting license sales with violent crimes on a county by county basis, basis nationwide throughout the United States. And he found that as hunting sales go up, so the violent crime comes down. So there's a pretty thorough assessment by scientists in, in this field. So we've got nothing to worry about. We've just got these, these extreme people, these fanatical people who've got nothing better to do than to mix up the world and make everything almost impossible to care.